thank you very much for this invitation to be here tonight. I feel deeply honored to be part of this assembly, and I hope that what I've prepared says something, says something to you uh, about your own experience, about your own lives. Sort of a prologue. Prior to leaving Cambridge this afternoon, I participated in a press conference that was arranged by several persons who recently attended the Permanent People's Tribunal convened in Mexico. That tribunal received testimony from people who were exiled from El Salvador or people who were intending to return to that country. And that testimony was days upon days of, rep of uh, stories of repression, torture, unspeakable atrocities. Language, quite honestly, fails me. The tribunal found the government of El Salvador guilty of genocide and found the United States complicit in that act. Military aid, we all know that the United States is providing military aid, advises in covert CIA activities like agrarian reform, similar to the Vietnam pacification program, which has at its heart the terrorization and the murder of peasants, a way of flushing out and killing organizational leaders. The US uh, media has not reported on the tribunal. Rather, the United States press has persisted in presenting to the American public an image of the El Salvadoran government as a centrist representative body under attack by terrorist guerrillas. This, of course, is false. The pseudo-Christian Democratic Party is not representative of the people. Rather, it represents individual politicians in league with the army, who are in league with the eight ruling families of El Salvador who control the economy. Also false is the white paper of the State Department, which, presents, which says that the violence is random and scattered. That is false. Rather, what is happening in El Salvador is a program of systematic terrorism organized by hit squads at the dispatch of the army. I raise the El Salvador then today is a country literally washed in the blood of martyrs. I raise this criminal condition in order to deepen our own awareness of global militarism and the terror which confronts us all. And to paraphrase Camus, if another suffers in any part of the world, that suffering is also mine. I've prepared a short paper tonight to speak to what brings us here tonight, namely uh, the trial of the Plowshare Aid. And I've entitled my reflections, Cracking the Edifice of Violence. They took hammers and blood and broke the silence. With hammers and blood, they crack the despair of violence. Their hammers and blood will endure. Their act of hope will endure. None of us, none of us ever remain the same. So we stand together tonight to declare a profound no to all that is of war. We stand together tonight to bear witness to those whose no to war wrenches from them the days and the nights of their lives. We stand together tonight to hear their no and to allow that hearing to make a difference in our lives, that their risk and our living may not be in vain. We stand together tonight to the speak to the conscience of our country, to sweep away the refuge of lies and the scourge of national arrogance. We stand together tonight to renew that everlasting covenant, to strengthen the band of justice around our waist and the belt of faithfulness upon our hips. We stand together tonight that the sound of weeping be no longer heard in the land, that the continuum of peacemaking be renewed, be deepened, and be blessed. War, destruction and death, terror and horror, violence and dreadful silence. The silence of war is the other side of that silence that prepares for war. The terror of war is the reflection of that terror which constructs war. The death of war is the consequence of that death which leads to war. War, the mirror of the society that produces it. Death begets death. Who is not dehumanized in a society organized around war? 
around the lie that the stranger is not also a neighbor, a living human being with thoughts and feelings like my own, who is not dehumanized in a society rooted in fear, threatened by power which can destroy all sentient life, who is not dehumanized in a society structured in violence, in social relations of domination and oppression, relations which are the very stuff of capitalist patriarchal culture, who is not dehumanized as weapons are made, as the poor are denied, as the earth is raped, as the war state obtains, each one of us is diminished. I ask you to consider this evening the social relations that are of war, those conventional patterns of being together which contain and predict the savagery of war. Such relations of domination and oppression are the very heart of male supremacist mores. They are the machinery which produces the war state. They are the reproductive centers which foster the war mind. Peacemaking requires that these relations be overturned that male rule be dismantled, and that patriarchal systems be abolished. Let us consider for a moment the nature of patriarchy. Patriarchy is a legacy of power, passed on from father to son, which provides access and privilege of varying amounts to the male gender class. This structure of social organization ruled by elite fathers can be traced to the familial patriarch who governed the family and linked the private sphere of home with the public world of work and influence. In this scheme, male supremacy obtained and flourished. Social, cultural, and political institutions enforced this fundamental complex by duplicating gender roles embedded in the family. This entire system developed a religious and social mythology to sustain its structures, developed weapons to maintain its control. And so a double ethic evolved, loving nurturance in the home and disembodied rationality in the public province. Thus, an edifice of male power and female subordination became the unquestioned paradigm that undergirded social organization. Patriarchal values became normative, male definitions reigned. Such a political foundation gave rise to sexism, racism, imperialism, classism, and other social atrocities. These devastating contradictions are maintained by specific mechanisms which ensure their preservation. Among them are three which I'd like to discuss very briefly. They are colonization, dehumanization, and the objectified other. They are critical components in patriarchy's apparatus. They form the social cohesion which is of war. Colonization. To colonize is to control, to institutionalize power over others by the systematic imposition of norms which define and order reality in the interests of the colonizer. Essential to this process is the internalization of the oppressor's values by the colonized, a process which is structurally reinforced by media propaganda, legitimating stereotypes, and the manipulation of language. Women know the deceit of colonization. We are a people whose culture has been devalued or destroyed, whose history has been buried or erased, as primary victims, women are painfully conscious of the deep extent to which male supremacist norms inhabit our lives, even the crevices of thought and imagination. We know that the inmost reaches of free self-definition are won only through strenuous efforts to root out male standards. Sensitive men address similar questions in their lives. I believe that the military is the essential practitioner of contemporary colonization, the determining agent whose ideology is the prevailing worldview, the decisive influence in the use, abuse of human energies, natural resources, technological developments, national and international policy. The colonization affected by the military exposes a fundamental operating principle of male rule. Two, dehumanization. 
who is not dehumanized in the society around, organized around war, that very grounding produces a stagnation of thought and feeling which allows the routinization of war making. Dehumanization is the deadly consequence of alienation, the separation of the self from its center, from nature, from the extended human community of past, present, and future. Dehumanization is the effective diminishment of love for life, a numbing to the meaning of human existence. The state of patriarchy is the state of codified dehumanization. Its institutions are based on intrinsic dualities, which prohibit individual and collective integrity. Dualisms of mind over body, thinking over feeling, heaven over earth, spirit over flesh. Dualisms which identify women with a negative side. In all of this, in every part of this, war is served. For male rule produces the robotized personality whose need for self-assertion is channeled into war-making. This computerization of persons is analogous to male feminization of women. Definitions of women's sphere, proper female virtues, and appropriate gender behavior combine to stifle inherent originality and holistic self-actualization. Further, these manipulations breed suspicion of the self-defined female and contribute to divisions among women. Female resistance to male feminization, as well as male rejection of macho, and female-male opposition to inane computerization is the energetic no to patriarchal dehumanization. That no is also a no to war. The objectified other. I agree, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> The objectified other, are you ready? <laughs> Male power requires the objectified other. What does that mean? That presence over against which male might defines itself. Upon the other, patriarchy projects the negative characteristics which it refuses to confess in itself. Thus, women are emotional and communal, blacks are lazy and irresponsible, the poor are defective and ignorant. The other is the enemy, those to be mocked, to be controlled, to be killed. Patriarchal consciousness defines the self at the expense of the other, overpowers the other to satisfy its self-proclaimed excellence, murders the other to prove that the gods are on their side. War is the struggle for immortalizing power. Thus the enemy of war is the gook, the pinko, the red. Just as the enemy of social relations, woman, is the bitch, the pussy, the nag. Not seen as human, then, the enemy can be killed. They never really existed. The logic of slaughter is built on the logic of the objectified, non-human other. Thus, military is about power, about competition, might, force, regimentation, systems of command, and the myth of the hero, the very values which form the essential fabric of male culture are those which ground the war state. Patriarchy is itself an atrocity-producing situation, is itself a state of combat, is a state of sin. As the poet Marge Piercy writes, the man from Mars with sterile mountains at his back, perhaps strip mined, perhaps the site of weapons testing, if we open that armor like a can, would we find a robot? Quaking old flesh, the ghost of an inflated bond issue? Evil old men, banal as doorknobs, who rule the world like a comic strip, you are the father who eats his young, the final purity of the male principle of Connor and Kill. You are the god of the Puritans playing war games on computers. You can give birth to nothing except death. In essence, as long as male power obtains, war will prevail. As long as women are not free, peace is denied. As women become free, the social relations of war are exposed and overturned. It is my conviction that patriarchal leaders deny their violence, repress their collective murder, and refuse the awesome truth of human connectedness. Their consummate dedication to systematic terrorism 
derives from the fact that influential patriarchs across the globe are cognizant of the violence of which the other male leadership is capable. Male rulers of diverse origins agree on a definite understanding of power. Power is controlled by the force of might. This significant recognition bonds the struggle to end patriarchy with the struggle to bring about peace. It underscores the truth that the politics of feminism is the foundation of peacemaking. Feminism, I contend, is the veritable shaking of the foundations, a living of right relation grounded in active love, global solidarity, just resource distribution, shared ecological dedication. Feminism is about hope, about limitless space, faith, despite the overwhelming dread of contemporary history. Women look into that heart of darkness, patriarchy, and believe that life is more than the fathers announce. Feminism is a declaration that we women want our freedom passionately enough to let go of all else. And that freedom we seek is about peace, about an end to war, an end to structured violence. Feminism is a statement that we refuse to be victims of male despair, refuse to be victims of the machismo of slaughter. Thus, feminism is a politics of risk, of courage, whose essence is righteous anger and abundant love. This much we have learned from our living. Life begets life. Life for all of us, women, men, children, animals in the earth, is found only outside and beyond patriarchal rule, beyond their sad and shallow definitions, beyond their dead and static knowing, beyond their amnesia, beyond their impotence, beyond their wars, wars which unmask the fear, insecurity, and powerlessness which are the source of male might. On August 6, 1978, I stood with 40,000 others before the Peace Memorial in Hiroshima. I stood in that burning sun less than a mile where a little boy was dropped. And I remembered that awful burning of 33 years before. Blast, heat, fire, black rain, thirst, deep thirst, pain without relief. A memory of terror, of hell, of naked evil. The memory of war stalks us all, carves its meaning in our cells, haunts the days and nights of our lives. And war is now, in the savagery of every day, in the texture of every weapon built. But there is another memory, a memory of that strong continuum of persons who have said no to violence and no to war. Their lives ring through the ages, landmarks in the geography of hope, trees of life on the terrain of resistance, invincible spirits repulsed by the cruelty and waste of war, the remembering of their words, their courageous acts, and their relentless determination is a political act which contributes to social reconstruction. Hear the words of Ros Rosika Schwimmer, proclaimed at the Hague Congress of Women in 1915. The bloodshed must stop. This is what we women must thunder at those who would say, we want what you want, peace, but later. Us, there is no later. For us, there is only now, immediately. Words of peace by a woman of peace whose voice carries across time and space, whose mes message has yet to be fully heard. It seems to me that the terror of nuclear annihilation which confronts us all demands that women's voices be heard, that the politics of feminism integrate all efforts for peace. Practically speaking, this means that the evil of male supremacy be acknowledged as a cause of war, as an edifice of violence. Further, this means that peacemaking include active efforts against male power in all its forms, that the peace community commits itself to a political analysis that synthesizes the patriarchal roots of war with other causal factors. This, I believe, is the radical dismantling of the lies which cement the war state and the building up of that truth which genuinely frees. Will such efforts put an end to war? What we already know is that centuries of other means have failed. In the name of peace, war is waged, weapons developed, lives lost. Testimonies are announced, treaties signed, declarations stated, pronouncements issued. And still the battles go on. Patriarchy remains intact. Women are not free. 
nothing changes. This time, the revolution must go all the way. The sin of sexism, that sin of war, has been with us long enough. Life itself demands that it be rooted out, and we will root it out. For the spirit of peace is indeed with us all, and we are anointed to cast it forth into the world, to proclaim liberty to captives and the opening of prisons to those who are bound, to comfort all who mourn, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. And justice will roll down like water, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. And righteousness, dear sisters, dear brothers, shall prevail all over the land, shall prevail all over the land. Thank you.